thank you for that. We're now going to move from conversation about Asia and the Americas and Europe and focus on the Middle East. We're now going to be handing over to a champion of women leaders in the Middle East. Her name is Sophie Leray, and she's the founder and spokesperson for WIL Economic Forum, the first platform for business women leaders in the Middle East and Asia, based in Dubai for over a decade. She's also the co-author of the award-winning Game Changers, How Women in the Arab World Are Changing the Rules and Shaping the Future. Sophie, it's fantastic having you with us. Thank you for joining us. And we would like to also recognize that you are the co-founder of the Eve List, a global not-for-profit organization dedicated to making those global connections and pushing leadership forward around the world. Madam, the stage is yours. Enjoy, and thank you for being with us. Thank you very much for inviting me. And we're going to talk more about much more than just the Middle East, uh, but really about what diversity can be as a, a leveraging tool uh, for companies to face the challenges of, uh, of tomorrow. So uh, in my personal expertise, I would say closing the gender gap in the workforce, um, according to McKinsey, could add $28 trillion to the global GDP. And that was in 2015. Imagine $28 trillion is nearly the size of the US and the Chinese economies uh, together. So post-COVID and within the millennial morning li working lifetime, people groups that were historically underrepresented will reach the majority status in the US. However, only six countries currently have achieved 100% equal rights for men and for women, according to the World Bank. The global average is about 74, which means that women receive just three quarters of the legal rights than men do. So it's, a, it's an interesting statistics. And uh, recently, a research that was done uh, by, by McKinsey post-COVID um, surveyed uh, thousands of men and women in the workplace to feel their, you know, their sentiment uh, post-COVID. And it was quite interesting to see that women in leadership positions, for example, were 1.4 more likely to scale down or to actually drop off the workforce due to burnout, mainly. Uh, now, when it comes to Black women, to Latinas, to Asian women, to LGBTQ and women with disabilities, it, they face even greater challenges and, and more distinctive challenges in the workplace. So like stress, exhaustion, uh, an in, really an incapacity to, to bring their whole self uh, at work and a feeling of being excluded in, during that, that COVID uh, lockdown in, particu in particular. Um, for example, another, another interesting statistic is that the unemployment rate uh, is more than the double than for, for persons that are dis with a disability in the US. It's 8%, the double than uh, people without a disability. So companies are really at a crossroads. They have two options. They can recognize these challenges and reinvent the way they do work uh, to be more sustainable and to eventually be profitable for everyone. Or they don't, and uh, they face the consequences of uh, a disengaged workforce. So today, I want to invite two people to discuss that, to discuss diversity or doom. Uh, it's an historical moment, and, and the great leader of tomorrow understands the power of and the benefits of leading an, ex an inclusive team, of creating that space where people can be stimulated and, and contribute uh, to, uh, to a, a collective um, uh, mission. So how do we do that? Um, and especially in a time, like we said earlier, in a time of, of real uncertainty and of crisis. So uh, as I said, I'm happy to introduce two people um, who um, both intersectionality and expertise are going to give us a, a really rich soil for a conversation uh, today on how to design uh, these type of uh, new workspaces. So Razia Aziz uh, is a, a hello uh, is a, on a lifelong personal and professional journey uh, to crack the code of human nature. She is quite the Renaissance woman, uh, <laughs> I can say, <laughs> an, an artist, a writer, a speaker, a coach, a facilitator, a trainer, a consultant, 
a bodywork pr practitioner, an interfaith minister, and a spiritual counselor. But uh, you've been for uh, dedicating your entire career to support companies in growing their uh, leadership teams and developing these inclusive uh, practices that we're going to talk about. Uh, you are the co-founder and the director of the Equality Academy based in the UK. And we will be joined as well by John Tanzella, uh, the president and CEO of the International uh, LGBTQ Travel Association, a non-profit tourism tourism association that is the global leader in advancing LGBTQ travel. Uh, LGLTA is based in Florida, USA, uh, with teams located all over the world and uh, is, an, is made of a network that is about 5,000 tourism business professionals in approximately 80 countries, reaching more than 4 million unique travelers in 2009. Um, so, uh, first thing first, uh, I would like to leave the floor to uh, to Razia uh, to really introduce the conversation with some of your thoughts and takeaways, and then we will follow with some questions to uh, both of you. Razia. Thank you, Sophie. Thank you so much. A pleasure to be here today. So let's start on common ground. Take a moment and breathe. Bring your mind to your breath and notice the sensations in your body, your feet, on the ground. As we do this together at different places on the planet, we share in experiences that are common across humanity, breath, body sensations, connection with the earth and conscious awareness. Reaching back in time to the first of our ancestors who noticed that they were awake, we participate in the conscious commons of life. Our awareness gives us the ability to put ourselves in another's shoes, to feel another's feelings, to connect with their hopes and fears. It gives us the potential for reciprocity and for compassion. Awareness also alerts us to danger and enables us to guard and defend ourselves and those we cherish. We are social creatures who live and often die by our group membership. We are wired both to survive and to belong. But our legitimate need for security and belonging can at any time tip over into greed and superiority, leading to the diminishment, rejection and even the elimination of those outside our circle. We live our lives plotting a course between these two tendencies of awareness, um, of including, including and embracing the other and excluding or rejecting the other. How we now navigate this course will de determine the fate of this planet. There's nothing more human than the stories we tell about ourselves. Today, I'm telling you a story, one of danger and of hope. I chose the title Diversity or Doom, and doom is no exaggeration, as we've already seen, but nor is the hope that a fresh approach to leadership can help us find better solutions, and I want to challenge you to find that leadership in you. Diversity is a facet of and an asset to all living systems. The Earth's living systems are incredibly diverse and involve a very high degree of interdependency and cooperation. Their resilience and adaptability depend upon this. The smallest organism has essential role and has a dignity of place in the system. Excess predation, on the other hand, is rewarded with extinction. It's as if nature had an inbuilt moral co code. Don't get too big for your boots or your boots will bite you. The delicate balance of life can only be maintained through the acceptance of what the late chief rabbi in the UK, Jonathan Sachs, called the dignity of difference. As a species, we are part of the biosphere, yet our net activity on the planet has in the last few hundred years set us on a course to doom, a course of our own making. We find ourselves in the midst of climate catastrophe, pandemics and violent conflicts. Human and animal habitats are under threat. Rulers are bent on control of the land, wealth and natural resources for the benefit of a few, often exploiting long-standing religious and ethnic divides. They have spawned a colossal refugee crisis. 
None of this is sustainable. If we're to survive and allow other species to thrive, our tendency to cooperation must now come to outweigh the Darwinian war of all against all paradigm, which has been favored by dominant cultures. Uh, a little note for our Chinese and American friends, I think. Let's take a deep breath and reflect upon the human story. We don't have to look far to see the deep fault lines in our societies. There are major inequalities in access to power, resources and life chances across what we have come to refer to as diversity characteristics. Socioeconomic status, gender, race, ethnicity, disability and relationship to the land. Even as our numbers rise exponentially and we become more diverse, the places of real power and wealth in human society are still populated by a relatively small and homogenous group of people. Instead of equality, diversity and inclusion, these places are characterized by inequality, homogeneity and exclusion, even with the shifts of the balance of power globally. All systems, including human led systems, involve feedback loops. These outcomes are symptoms of negative feedback loops. For example, during the common, cur current pandemic, we constantly risk responding in ways that seem rational, but end up deepening social divides. For example, failing to shield the vulnerable, shedding less organized and more marginalized sections of our workforce, thus incre increasing gender, racial, ethnic and socioeconomic inequalities, as the recent McKinsey report shows. Deeper inequalities also lead to a greater risk of infection spread, so the feedback loop is complete. The same is true of the prison system. We put in prison people who are already marginalised, for instance, they are poorer or they are minority racial and ethnic people. Those so-called crimes um, that, that they have committed often arise from their exclusion and marginalization. And when they're released, they're even more marginalized and therefore more likely to end up impoverished and, of course, back in prison. We aim to correct criminality. Instead, we multiply it. It doesn't have to be this way. We can learn from the regenerative capacity of nature, its positive feedback loops. How many of you noticed signs of regeneration during the various lockdowns over the last summer? I found that wild flowers bloomed where before was close mown grass. Hedgehogs appeared in the churchyard across the road. Birds populated the trees and their songs filled the air, which itself was cleaner. Strangers stopped in the street, sat together on benches at respectful distance and shared stories of everyday life neighborhoods spontaneously organized to help those who were isolated or sick. We practiced collaboration, cooperation and care. Despite the fear engendered by the pandemic, many of us expanded to allow others in. For nearly two decades now, research internationally has extolled the benefits of diversity and inclusion to businesses, particularly at leadership level. It has shown how these are not just nice to have, but essential for adaptation, innovation and success. Most of the research has focused upon gender, but there have also been studies relating to ethnicity, sexual orientation and disability. It's a classic win-win situation. Businesses can both do the right thing and benefit on bottom line indicators. All they have to do is expand to allow others into places of power and influence. So why don't they? Part of the answer lies in the conflict between our two countervailing tendencies to expand and cooperate or to contract and exclude, thus triggering positive or negative feedback loops. Any challenge to, uh, to existing privileges feels like a threat, particularly in dangerous times, and we are in dangerous times. And where there is threat, exclusion often wins out. But as we have seen, not always. Enter you and I. This moment in our history is crying out to each of us to make the most of expansive, loving and courageous sides of human nature, to commit to leadership that is inclusive and in service to more than ourselves and others like us. Now is the time to choose a regenerative approach to leadership that attends to the health of the whole, not just narrow self-interest. This means finding in ourselves leadership that is willing to recognise and share our privileges, not as an act of charity, you understand, but as a jointly understood survival necessity.
To this we cannot to do this we cannot avoid the discomfort of confronting our biases, prejudices and assumptions. In the words of author Robert Johnson, we must learn to own our own shadow. And that is just the start of our journey. Biases are not merely individual. They are programmed by the families, societies and organisations in which we have learned our place in the world. Our leadership must be committed to unlearning fear and greed based habits in ourselves and others and fostering and institutionalizing collaborative cooperative habits of care of self and other. It's very hard to achieve, but I'm not sure the alternative is a walk in the park either. Look, we're nothing if not intelligent and compassionate. And right now we need both in order to respond to the urgent need for a planetary of a planetary system that is critically ill. We won't be alone. We'll be with others who are willing to reach outside their comfort zones of gender, class, caste, disability, religion, sexual orientation, to do small and big daily and periodic extraordinary things to increase the diversity of lived experience, genes and cultures in any environment of which we are a part. It is essential now that we ensure that those who have been on the margins are afforded the dignity of place in the ecosystem and can bring their wisdom to decisions that will affect our common destiny. Echoing Nisha Anand, whose TED talk, The Radical Act of Choosing Common Ground, challenged me to think differently. I would like to end this talk with a personal story. At the time of the partition of India in 1947 and the independence of India and Pakistan, my eldest uncle, a Muslim who was against partition, was a very young forestry officer in the current Indian Prime Minister's home state of Gujarat. Fearing for his safety in the intercommunal violence that accompanied partition, which claimed perhaps two million lives and resulted in the largest forced migration of people in history, he appealed for help to his Hindu colleagues. This was itself a huge risk. He had to trust that they would support rather than expose him. His gamble paid off. Despite the risks involved, his workmates helped save his life. He adopted a Parsi name, the Parsis were on the whole untouched by communal violence, and they conspired to hide his Muslim identity until the time of danger had passed. He was in his 20s. He later became the chief conservator of forest for the state of Gujarat. He married, he had two children and lived into his 80s. The people who saved my uncle were not activists or diversity, equality and inclusion specialists. They had not studied systems theory. They were ordinary people showing extraordinary bravery. In doing so, they acted to mitigate the huge negative feedback loop which had been activated across the subcontinent, harming people and relationships, threatening the very idea of a diverse and inclusive nation. Stories such as this, and you will no doubt find your own, remind us constantly that the presence of danger does not have to result in us clinging to our privileges or shutting out the other. We can remember to breathe, feel the earth beneath our feet, hear the hopeful songs of our ancestors and decide instead to expand and allow the possibility of inclusion of others in the joint project of saving the world that we love. Thank you. Thank you, Razia. Wow, that was quite of a philosophical uh, approach to uh, to it. So, uh, thank you. A lot of thoughts, lots of thoughts come in my mind. But I'm going to go uh, a little bit because we're very short in time. Uh, have a, a bit of a chat with with John on uh, on very practical aspects of your mandate uh, as the uh, as a travel association. Um, I, I understand that your organization conducted a survey. Uh, of, uh, I think, of 15,000 uh, people during COVID-19 uh, to see well, what really LGBTQ travelers uh, uh, were facing earlier this year. So what did the results uh, reveal about this community? I can't hear you. You're muted. Uh, yeah. Can you hear me now? <laughs> yes. First of all, bonjour and thank you, uh, Sophie, for including LGBTQ uh, community in this very important conversation. 
Yeah, so we did do a survey of about 15,000 LGBT travelers. And, you know, anecdotally, we've always known it's a resilient and loyal travel segment um, with a tendency to travel more frequently than non-LGBT travelers. So we wanted to do a bit of a deep dive into um, the sentiment for traveling post-COVID. And we did it in five key markets, um, the United States, France, uh, for example, Brazil, uh, and a few others. And we, we compared it to the same questions, for example, in the United States with US travel to compare the propensity of travel for post-COVID. And, and it was remarkable on, on the differences of the desire you know, to travel between LGBT travelers and non-LGBT travelers. So it, it's a very in-depth uh, report, which obviously we don't have time today, but anyone can download that off of our website. But you know, it's, it's, you know, we're all often referred to as a, as a niche community, but, but we really have a strong and loyal market um, with a real strong passion for, for experiencing travel and cultures, history, and, you know, everything that makes travel so special. So it's, it's, it's a very important market as far as the tourism industry is concerned. For sure. And your mandate uh, as an association is to uh, actually as well support the efforts of, of incoming destination and of, of uh, travel, tra the travel industry to make this yeah. industry more inclusive. So um, what are what would you say are the, the simple actions like like what I was saying at the end, sometimes you don't you don't need a, a PhD in inclusion to to be an inclusive place. Right. So what are the. The, the simple actions that businesses and tourism uh, can do to ensure they are being welcoming, they are being inclusive, they are making people feel like they, they belong there, even if it's for a, a, a certain short, I mean, a short period when you travel. Right, yeah, no, that's, a, that's a very relevant question. And, and being that we do business in 80 countries, you know, when you look at different cultures and what are mature mm -hmm. markets for our community versus more emerging, it's, it's very different. Yeah. Um, but, but for the basic, you know, um, and we work with governments, we work with tour operators and travel advisors, airlines, cruise lines, uh, hotels, you know, and they all have different priorities and, and, and missions themselves. But some of the very, you know, the very basic is, you know, if you're going to be interested in diversity and in particular LGBTQ travelers, um, you know, making sure you're doing the right thing internally before you go to market because I think in any community, we, we sense a bit of, you know, um, insincerity if, if you're not really treating your employees correctly mm -hmm. and giving them a seat at the table. And that's true for, for, um, for all segments of diversity. But, you know, including, you know, real images in your marketing, you know, working with the local pride organizations or, or whatever LGBT organizations might be in your particular region. And again, that can be challenging in certain parts of the world. But there are LGBT people everywhere, and uh, it's just a way of you know engaging them and um, doing the right thing for diversity. And you know some of the conversations today, you know about, about diversity, have been kind of weaved in. It's it's a really important topic, and I would say the travel industry is is has always been a leader in diversity and equity and inclusion. Um, but I'm really proud of what's been going on this year in particular. When you would have thought. DEI would have been thrown out the, you know, out the back door with with the current financial situation around the world. But we're seeing a lot of businesses put a priority on this is important. Our, 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 you know, under a normal year, our audience, our customers are very diverse, yeah. and we need to support that. And I'm glad to see that's that's still happening. And there's a lot to do, but it hasn't completely gone away. That's 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 very. So it's not doom. <laughs> no, I don't okay. think it's true, no. I, yeah. I think there's an opportunity. Yes. Um, Razia, what, what type of organization do you work with? Uh, and and what what is usually the what is the, 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 the reason, the, the you know, what brings them to suddenly come to the realization that they need to uh, engage in more inclusive practices? Okay, so we get a range of organizations from um, multinational corporates to um, small community organizations and we like to offer 
uh, and they come to us for slightly different reasons. But on the whole, both the public uh, and third sector and private sector corporates, they tend to come to us because um, either something has happened in the world, such as the killing of George Floyd. I mean, remarkable things have happened this year where organizations that would never have, I mean, the phone hasn't stopped ringing um, since the Black Lives Matter movement brought racism to the fore. So they're very concerned that they're not able to respond appropriately mm -hmm. to something that has happened. Quite often it's something that's happened in the organisation or there's a change of legislation um, and people and organi organisations are very often in a reactive place when they come to us and they're looking to us for solutions. And sadly, um, we, we, we say to them, well, let's find out what it is you really need to change and uh, we don't come in and fix anything. We walk alongside you and help you grow this culture from the inside because you know, any consultant can write um, a consultancy report, charge a lot of money. I could write one off the shelf for almost any organisation. Mm -hmm. It won't make any difference. The sort of thing John's talking about isn't going to change by people throwing a bit of training at it or, you know, putting some nice pretty pictures on their website. Yeah. You know, it's that couple that goes to, you know, with their the, the two women and their baby who go to the hotel reception and they are asked if it, they obviously want a twin bed and where's the husband? I mean, it's that kind of situation and changing those sorts of things in cultures means inviting people to get really uncomfortable Mm -hmm. And in order to do that, you really need to walk alongside them and understand their challenges. Yeah. Because it's not about punishing people and telling them that they're bad and wrong. Yeah. It's really about saying, look, we're on a journey together here where we all have to expand. And expanding is uncomfortable. But it's really good for business and it's really good for the whole, you know, for the whole sector, for equality in the world generally and for a better outcome for the planet. So those tiny interactions create that big effect yeah you go and have a great experience in a hotel you want to go back again and you tell your friends about it you know that's that's the way these things work those are the positive feedback loops we're looking for yeah i have a question for uh, i have two questions actually for both of you i'll start with uh, the you, you, both of you mentioned basically authenticity so what's on the mission statement needs to be on the heart of of everyone in the organizational chart from the top to the to the bottom and um often at least in my experience uh sometimes you've convinced the top it's great because it's good for business so they get it and then it's very difficult to trickle down through the organization so how do you make allies of that people group that might feel like you know their piece of the pie has been becoming smaller and smaller because there there, there are people that will feel like they're something is taken away from them who wants to take that that question i, I, I was gonna say typically we have kind of a reverse situation yes. where it's <laughs> not the top that's supporting it it's more like mm. the, um, and not to say that doesn't happen but we typically are working with you know lgbt people in communities and corporations etc but they're not getting the support from the top level and that's where you know, you do sometimes have to make the case of the financial, but it really, you know, without DEI, you're not going to make, you're not going to see the financial rewards. So it's the right thing to do. Um, and then it's also the right thing for business, but it's, it's so important to support your employee groups and your, and your customers. Mm. Yeah. I, I would say, I, I agree that there are, for us, the, the, the enthusiasts tend to be somewhere in the middle or to mm. the bottom of the organization. You do get enthusiasts in the top, but the very hierarchy within the organization can often prevent them actually being effective because people don't quite trust or believe them. They've had so many initiatives from the top and they don't feel that the people in the top of the organization understand the daily challenges that they face um, in the fine grain of their work. And if it's a very hierarchical organization, they've never been listened to either. So our role as consultants is always to go into the organization and insist on engaging with all the stakeholders, particularly those most marginalized within the organization itself. Uh, mm -hmm. And however nice the pronouncements from the leadership, they very rarely understand what the organization looks looks like from the reception desk or the back office or the or the kitchen. They mm -hmm. actually don't know what goes on there. Um, 
and uh, the support that staff need just in order to have a dignified day, day at work, let alone take on a new initiative that's been, you know, put up in lights by the, by the leadership. So I think we get into the organisational system, we try and understand how people feel marginalised and we listen and listen and listen. And then we try and feed those back that information back within the organization so there is a sense of common ownership of what they're doing mm, yeah uh, I, I, we don't have much time so we're going to have to wrap up but i would like to ask you both of you um it's it's a it's a bit of a, a question that it's a, it's obvious but it still needs to be asked did you did you see a change? Uh, I'm, I'm thinking of, about mindset mainly, a, a mindset change in organi the organizations you're working with um, since COVID-19 and, and how has it affected? You mentioned earlier on that you were impressed by the fact that there was, there was actually a, a surge of, of uh, desire to, to build those inclusive workplaces. Do you think it's going gonna, it's gonna to be there for, uh, to stay? Um, yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, I feel that the combination of um, the expo exposing of inequalities through COVID-19 and mm. the exposing of um, racial violence um, through the black, uh, it's very big here in the UK, I have to say, it's mm. like the whole Black Lives Matter thing, um, that actually there has been a real change in consciousness. I feel, I'm finding, particularly on the race issue, that white people who genuinely want to make a change around racism are really digging very deep right now into their knowledge, understanding and experience and wanting to work alongside to bring some real change. I think it's very hopeful, you know, mm -hmm. out of some of the darkest times, I think, does come the brightest light. And I, I don't want to over egg that because, you know, our fortunes are always up and down. But I do think there is there is a significant change. And I think it's not just about race. I think it's bringing up the whole idea of lived experience and how lived experience has to be respected and understood. Yeah. And we have to institutionalize the changes. It's not just about individuals. Mm. John? Yeah, I would echo um, um, Razia, um, the Black Lives matter movement really brought to light at least here in the states a systemic situation that needed to be addressed that's always it has always been there it's always been under the carpet and it's brought to light the situation and, and it's expanded globally and all types of organizations all types of people have really rallied behind it because it applies to a lot of people and a lot of groups but specifically the black lives uh, matter movement has been really, really important here in America and, and abroad. Uh, it, it's, I don't think it's going to go away. I think it's really, I think here anyway, you know, with the new administration, getting back to prioritizing diversity and equity and inclusion, um, I think it's, it's hopefully will be expanded upon. I mean, you look at Biden's appointments, um, it's a diverse uh, group of individuals, the way and administrations used to be, unfortunately not the last four years, but uh, I think it's here to stay. I think there's a lot of potential and a lot we have to do um, as organizations together. Yeah, but like I mentioned in, in my introduction, uh, in the US, I, that was a stat that I found from for the US, uh, in the life, in the work life of a millennial, there will be no more minority groups which is very interesting. So oh, yeah. it has to change. Naturally, things have to change. Uh, I, I see that, at least in, in, in my field of expertise, um, women won't any longer accept the status quo. So it's changing. They're getting organized into communities. They are, they are the, the ones that are already in senior positions are helping the others to uh, to come up so it's 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 moving in the right direction so i i am glad i'm glad we we agree um unfortunately we don't have more time and for q and a's but thank i wanted you. to uh, thank you for this conversation and uh, and wishing you a great day john 